The power rule tends to be the thing in calculus that people forget, uh, remember, excuse me, I should say, until their dying day. That's the one thing you might remember from calculus class. You can write it symbolically in a few different ways. I showed you these ways last time. If you're using function notation and f of x is x to the n power, then f prime of x is n times x to the n minus one power. That would be using function notation. If you don't use f of x, but use y, so here I'm emphasizing the function name is f. Here I'm emphasizing the dependent variable is y equals x to the n. Now, of course, I could also put a y equals up here as well. Then you could write that the derivative of that with respect to x, which can be written in a couple different ways, either as a y prime or here's something new, dy dx. That equals n times n x to the n minus one. This is called the Leibniz notation for the derivative. Leibniz is spelled L-E-I-B-N-I-Z. German, I think, Leibniz. E before I is an I sound in German. Leibniz notation. Leibniz was one of the co-inventors of calculus with Newton. And he used this notation, dy dx, for the derivative. Why did he use it? That's something we're going to get into next week. Looks like a fraction, doesn't it? Looks like dy divided by dx. And yeah, you've probably seen this in physics. It's not really a fraction, but you could think of it as a limit of fractions. And it doesn't hurt to pretend it's a fraction sometimes. In calculus, this is pretty amazing. Calculus is full of what I call convenient fictions. <clears throat> convenient fictions in a math class? Yes. And this is one of them. Pretending that's a fraction is a convenient fiction. It's not technically true. It's not a fraction. But it often doesn't hurt and even sometimes help helps to pretend it's a fraction. Okay? That's actually a pretty important thing to realize coming out of calculus. More notation for the power rule. We could also write it as x to the n prime equals n times x to the n minus 1. Or I guess I did show you this notation last time, d dx of x to the n power equals n times x to the n minus one. These are all different ways of writing the same fact. Four ways of saying the same thing. They're not four different properties. They are the exact same property written in four different ways. I typically use, well, okay, I, I use sort of this one, this one, and the last one the most. I use this one the least often. Though when I was being taught calculus, my professor used that one the most often. That's the one I use the least often. Okay. We have verified so far the power rule in the case, I believe, where n is 2, 3, and negative 1, and also 1 half. This works for any value of n. I emphasize even an irrational number like pi Though it does beg a question, why would you ever want to raise a number to the pi power? Could that have any applications? Uh, not really that I, any that I know of, but it's still true. Let's do another example. Let's do the case where n equals negative one half. What's the derivative with respect to x of x to the negative one half, which is the same as the derivative with respect to x of one divided by the square root of x? because that's what negative one half power means. Powers like this are not magical things. By definition, they are related to things like this, in this case, a square root. And I'm doing this at an arbitrary value of x. So when I write down the limit of my difference quotient, I do f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. I could have done, so I guess I'm using function notation there as well. This is my f of x. If x is something specific like one or two or three, that goes in place of the x here and here. If x were three, it would go here and here. And then I would have an honest to goodness constant there and h would be the only variable. But remember, like I said last time, when you do this calculation, 
For the purposes of the actual limit calculation, you, you, you do pretend X is fixed, a constant. H is the only variable here. You're letting H go to zero. Okay, now there's this technicality. H never actually equals zero in terms of the limit. You're asking what does this fraction approach as H goes to zero without actually equaling it. But as we've seen now many, many times, in the end, when you simplify it, you plug in H equals zero because in the end, you simplify to a continuous function of H, hopefully. Okay, I'm gonna keep reiterating this a lot. Still today, probably still next week. Gotta get it sinking in. But again, you, you can't just hear me here in these times we have in class and think that you're gonna remember. You have to spend some time thinking about it. Now, if you suffer from insomnia, maybe this is definitely a good thing to think about as you go to sleep, because maybe it'll you know bore you to sleep if you think about it. But hopefully that will also have the benefit of getting it in your brain and sticking there. So we calculate the limit, uh, assuming X is fixed and letting H go to zero. But in the end, after we get an answer, it will depend on X and therefore will still be a function of X in the end. Whether a symbol is a variable or a constant is all in your mode of thought, how you are thinking about it. Should I write it as X to the negative one half power or something over square root of X, uh, one over square root of X, I'm gonna do one over square root of X. Did an example like this last time, except the square roots were not there. And I said, there were two ways you could do this. You could, instead of dividing by H, you could think of it as multiplying this entire thing by one over H, subtracting the fractions by getting a common denominator. That still could be done here, but once again, I'll do the same trick as before. I'll multiply by a disguised form of one, chosen in such a way to cancel the denominators in the top of the big fraction. In this case, the product of square root of X plus H and square root of X, I'll get cancellation with both of those. But if I do it to the top, I've got to do it to the bottom to compensate so that I'm really just multiplying by a disguised form of one and not changing the value of the expression when it is defined. So after doing this, the top, well, the main thing is that we get rid of the fractions within fractions. When I multiply this out on the top, in this one, the square root of X plus H cancels, leaving me with just a square root of X. In this one, the square root of X cancels, leaving me with a square root of X plus H. Hmm. And I'm realizing I'm gonna have to do a couple tricks here, I think. I was thinking just this one trick would work, but uh, I think I'm gonna have to do a couple tricks with this one. There's still a problem. Um, I'd like to see the goal is that I, in the end, I want to plug in H equals zero, but I still have an H there. And if I plug in H equals zero, I'll be dividing by zero problem. What typically has happened is we've been able to cancel that H with some, an H on the top, divide it out. But we've got these square roots here. You can't do it. That square root of X plus H is not equal to square root of X plus square root of H. Not, 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 not. Don't ever think that the square root of a sum is the sum of the square root roots. It's not true. As an example, the square root of uh, four plus nine is the square root of 13. And that does not equal the square root of four plus the square root of nine, because that is two plus three is five and five is not the square root of 13. So you cannot break that apart into two pieces. I need to do another trick. Uh, Think rationalizing the numerator by now multiplying by square root of x plus square root of x plus h on the top and the bottom will be probably what I want to do. This should work. So up here in the first step with the red things here, I was trying to get rid of the fractions within fractions. Down here, I'm trying to get rid of the square roots in the numerator, hopefully getting a, just a factor of h that can cancel with the thing on the bottom. Could I have done this in just one step? Uh, perhaps if I had multiplied the top and the bottom by the product of X plus H and, and X, perhaps that might've worked. Let's see what happens here. It's kind of a mess, gonna be on the mess on the bottom. On the top, when I FOIL, 
square root of x times itself is just x. Again, when you put a got a minus sign there and you put a plus sign there, the key thing is that the outside and inside products cancel. The product of those two things added to the product of these two things cancels to zero because of the minus sign there and the plus sign there. Outside and inside terms cancel. Last times last will be minus the square root of x plus h times itself. Use parentheses. Yeah, that's looking better. Got a mess on the bottom. Do you need to multiply this all out? No, just leave it at like it is at the moment. It's fine. Distribute this minus sign through. You're going to be able to cancel the x's. x minus x is zero. You're left with the limit as h goes to zero of negative h over the mess on the bottom. Now divide out the h to leave a negative one up top after dividing it out. And now finally, we have something we can plug h equals zero into. <clears throat> and as long as x is not zero, when we do so, we're not dividing by zero. Now, technically, if x were zero, we'd be dividing by zero when we plug in h equals zero. But hey, guess what? That's not a problem. Because for our original function, x is not zero. We don't want to divide by zero there. The domain for f is all positive numbers. The open interval from zero to infinity, x is strictly greater than zero. So x won't equal zero here. x is positive. So there's no problem with dividing by zero now if we plug in h equals zero. Get a bunch of square root of x's down there. Doesn't look like it's the right answer yet, but it can be simplified. That product is x. This is two square root of x. So the overall end result then is to get negative one over 2x square root of x. That is the same as negative one half x to the negative three halves. <clears throat> That's the final answer. And that is what you would get with the power rule. Apply to this. Bring down that negative one half. Subtract one from the exponent negative one half x to the negative three halves. Same thing. This is the same thing, right? The negative one half comes from the negative one and the two. X times square root of X is X to the first times X to the one half, which is X to the three halves, but it's in the bottom. So I, if I write it as X in the top of a fraction, so to speak, it becomes a negative three halves power. Can I clarify anything there? It's tricky. You got to learn the tricks of the trade. These tricks of the trade here for solving this kind of problem. Again, maybe the first person to figure this out, maybe it took them a couple of years to figure it out. Maybe not. Maybe they they were smart enough to figure it out faster than that. But maybe. I mean, there are some things that take even the most the smartest people in the world many, many years to figure out. But now that they have figured it out and shared it with the rest of us, through books and so forth, we can learn how to do it more quickly. We can stand on the shoulders of giants. We can see further than them because we, we can stand on, on their shoulders. Okay. Are we going to prove the general power rule? Uh, not in its most general form, not when n is an arbitrary number. You're disappointed, huh? Uh, we can sort of, excuse me, <clears throat> sort of prove it when n is a positive integer, though. Let's do that. What's the derivative with respect to x of x to the n power? I'm going to assume n is a positive integer, meaning 
that says integer, I-N-T-E-G-E-R. Sorry that my writing gets kind of hard to read. That means N is one or two or three or four or five, et cetera. It's a, it's a natural number or whole number. Question? DDX just means take the derivative of whatever's inside here with respect to X. DDX notation, it's sometimes called operator notation. Take the derivative with respect to X of whatever is inside the parentheses. I'm doing it with the limit definition. So I'm going to verify that I get n times x to the n minus one, but I am going to wave my hands a little bit. It's not going to be a, a super precise, rigorous proof. So this is my f of x now. So just like before, this is f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. So this becomes x plus h to the n power minus x to the n power divided by h. Don't make the mistake of thinking x plus h to the n power is x to the n power plus h to the n power. You're forgetting lots of stuff. Pascal's triangle needs to be used in its most general description. There's the start of Pascal's triangle. Well, let's go one more row this time. Forever and ever. This row, for example, gives you the coefficients that you'd need for raising x plus h to the sixth power. What if n were a million though? Yeah, I'd have to keep going here. Till the, the, well, this is the seventh line technically, to the millionth and first line, millionth and first. I don't want to do that. I couldn't do that for the rest of my life. Can, is there a shorter description of this? Yes, it involves something called the binomial coefficient. N choose, what symbol should I use? N choose X. You've seen this before, ncx on calculators. n factorial divided by x factorial times n minus x factorial gives you the numbers in Pascal's triangle. It's a formula in appropriate spots. n is kind of like the power and x. x is not the same as this x. I should have used a, a different letter. x kind of represents which spot you are in the row. Starting with the zero spot, first spot, second spot, et cetera. So n minus one. Yeah, the, the key thing we need is n choose one. When x is one, what is n factorial? It means n times n minus one times n minus two, et cetera, down to three times two times one. That's what factorial means with the exclamation point. One factorial is just one n minus one factorial is n minus one times n minus two, et cetera, down to three times two times one. This is just a definition. All that cancels with this to leaving you with just n. And that represents the second term in each row of Pascal's triangle. First, well, when n is two, there, there it is. When n is three, four, five, six, and that's relevant for finishing this problem because what it means is the next term has a coefficient of n. And x is raised to one lower power. Hmm, that looks familiar. h is raised to one higher power. The next term would be something times x to the n minus two times h squared. What would the coefficient of that be? It would be n choose two replace x with two and it gets complicated. So instead I'm just gonna write higher order terms, hot for higher order terms. Well, except for the last one, we will write h to the n. Hot stands for higher order terms. Higher order terms really in h. 
the last of which higher powers of h, the last of which is h to the n power. The x to the n's cancel. So this is the part that's hand, hand wavy, saying higher order terms and not really saying what they are. And with what's left, every one of these terms has a factor of h that can be factored out. Maybe I should do higher order terms divided by h there. <laughs> That's kind of a joke. It's the, the previous higher order terms all divided by h. So that's kind of where I did that. I think I'll leave it there just for fun. They all do involve h though. This one doesn't involve an h. These do. These all involve a factor of H. Because the original higher order terms all involved the factor of at least H squared. H squared, then H cubed, then H to the fourth, et cetera. I divided out the H's and now what I'm left with is a function that's continuous in H. N times X to the N minus one plus higher order terms divided by h plus h to the n minus one. Now plug in h equals zero. Since all these involve a factor of h, when I plug in h equals zero, I get a bunch of zeros. The final answer is n times x to the n minus one. So it's not really a rigorous proof because of this Hannah wavy stuff with the higher order terms, but it's basically getting across the main idea.